Welcome to this QuestMed SBA tutorial. My name is Yezin, and today we will be running through core neurology for your clinical exams. So with neurology, we will be running through the most important aspects of neurological conditions relating to stroke, epilepsy, Parkinson's disease, multiple sclerosis, and Guillain-Barre syndrome. But also, we will be running through how to localize neurological disease and also how to choose the appropriate investigations and treatments and run through some common misconceptions in neurology to try and work on your weak points and help you to understand where to go when you encounter the neurological patient. So this is the first question, if you'd like to pause the screen and have a read. So the answer here is A. Total anterior cerebral infarct. So this is a 65-year-old male who presents with a sudden onset left-sided weakness, and there is reduced power in the left arm and leg, a left-sided homonymous hemianopia, and left-sided neglect. So the likely diagnosis here is that there is a acute ischemic stroke, and the point is to try and localize it to the correct area. So you'll know that um, when we are localizing, the right side of the cerebral cortex will supply the left side of the body. So that's why the, it should be on the right side. And then the other aspects that we need to look into is that whether or not it is a total or it is a partial anterior cerebral infarct or if it's a lacuna stroke. Usually with a lacuna stroke, it is less likely to be widespread and it's more likely to lead to a focal motor or a focal sensory disturbance. So therefore, it's less likely to be a lacuna stroke. And when we're considering whether or not it's a total or a partial anterior cerebral infarct, you can see that there's quite a lot going on here. So there's reduced power in the left arm, the leg, and left-sided homonymous hemianopia, and left-sided neglect. And even if you were to hedge your bets, you might also consider this to be total rather than partial, which would make it the correct answer. But you may also be aware of the classification, the Bamford classification for acute stroke, which we'll go through in more detail, and that might help you to localize in a more systematic fashion. So with the types of stroke, as you know, there are um, two different types of stroke, 85% are ischemic and 15% of strokes are hemorrhagic. So you can see on this left-hand side, you can see this hypodensity um, on the left side of the brain, and you can see that that is a very large ischemic stroke, whereas on the right-sided image on the right-hand side of the brain, you can see that there is a small hyperdensity, and that is consistent with a hemorrhagic stroke. The risk factors for stroke are, as you can see, multiple and tend to relate to vascular risk factors, and equally uh, they are similar to some extent to cardiovascular risk factors such as age, male sex, family history, hypertension, um, other aspects such as smoking and diabetes obviously are very important. Uh, but the one I'd like to just focus on a bit more is atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation is a very important um, risk factor for ischemic stroke. And one reason for that is, is because it's, there is a treatment for it. So if you were to treat someone with anticoagulation, it significantly reduces the risk of stroke. So it's something that you always need to look out for in the early stages. And also, you will want to anticoagulate patients who have had a stroke who also have atrial fibrillation. And you can do that by looking at their ECG, and you can see an irregularly irregular heart rate and also there may be a lack of P waves on ECG. Equally, with a hemorrhagic stroke, you also have similar vascular risk factors, but also there are others, such as being on anticoagulation therapy in the first place, and there are other less important risk factors, but it's important to ask anyone with a hemorrhagic stroke whether or not they have had any recreational drugs, and also if they have had any family history of vascular malformations, for example. Although, again, this is a smaller subset of patients with hemorrhagic stroke. So going back to the Bamford classification, which we were talking about earlier, you can roughly divide the classification of acute stroke into anterior, lacunar, and posterior stroke. And I've just left these um, indications here just to show you what each of them represent. But roughly speaking, a anterior circulation stroke can be to total, or partial, depending on how much of the brain is affected. And therefore, with a total, you would expect the anterior 
cerebral artery and the middle cerebral artery to be affected, whereas with the partial, it's either the anterior cerebral or the middle cerebral. And equally with the lacunar stroke, you would expect it to affect essentially the very deep perforating arteries, and you might expect a pure motor, pure sensory, and sometimes a sensory motor stroke. And finally, with a posterior stroke, these strokes are much more difficult to localize because they can be quite variable in their presentation. So it can lead to cerebellar dysfunction, problems with the brainstem, subsequently leading to eye movement disorders, cranial nerve palsies, and cortical blindness if it affects the occipital lobe. And these are secondary to the occlusions of the vertebrobasilar arteries and their branches. They are less common than anterior circulation stroke, but they can cause a significant amount of disability. So you should have a high index of suspicion with anyone who has a sudden onset acute neurological syndrome of any, any sort, as it could be either anterior, lacunar, or posterior stroke. So let's look at the next question, if you'd like to pause the screen and have a read. So the answer here is B, supportive management and neurosurgical referral. So let's look through the question. You have a 72-year-old man who has a sudden onset, again sudden, difficulty speaking, and inability to raise his right arm. He has a history of hypertension. He was last known to be well and three hours ago. And he has a blood pressure of 145 over 95, as well as a receptive aphasia and right arm paralysis. So the key here is that the CT head reveals a hyperintense lesion, in the left middle cerebral artery vascular territory. So looking at this, as we said earlier, when you have a hyperintense lesion, that is more likely to be a hemorrhagic stroke rather than an ischemic stroke. So with that in mind, let's look at the answers. So if someone has a hemorrhagic stroke, Intravenous alteplase is not appropriate because that is a treatment for an ischemic stroke as you're trying to break down the clot. Equally with C, aspirin 300 milligram orally is usually used for an ischemic stroke as it's an antiplatelet agent and therefore it helps to break down the clot, therefore would not be appropriate in someone who has a hemorrhagic stroke. And D, endovascular intervention, clot retrieval is used for large vessel strokes, so again, would not be appropriate as it's for ischemic strokes. And finally, with intravenous libitalol, that is used often in patients who have hemorrhagic stroke. However, we would normally try to maintain a blood pressure of around 140 over 90. So in this particular scenario, the blood pressure is about that number. So we wouldn't want to reduce it even further. However, in patients who have a high blood pressure, so maybe if it was one, systolic of 160 or 180, we may want to reduce it in the early period as that reduces disability going forward. So the answer therefore is supportive management, so that would be A, B, C, D, E, fluid resuscitation, and making sure that they are safe and not deteriorating from a hemodynamic perspective, and a neurosurgical referral. And the reason for that is because lots of hemorrhagic strokes may require neurosurgery, and you would want the patient to be assessed by the neurosurgical team to assess whether any intervention would be in the best interests of the patient. So that's why in this particular scenario, the answer is B. So looking more into the different types of bleeds, so we said earlier that we have hemorrhagic strokes, um, but there are also other kinds of bleeds that you can come across very common in your neurological practice. So on this left-hand side, you can see some slight white uh, aspects throughout the brain, and that is consistent with a subarachnoid hemorrhage. So that is when you have a bleed in the subarachnoid space, and it often tends to be related to an aneurysm, for example, but it can also be traumatic. And it's slightly less obvious, as you can see here, so you need to look into the middle of the brain and see whether or not there's any evidence of hyperdensity, which could be consistent with a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Looking at the middle picture, you can see that there is a large um, movement um, of the uh, of the brain in the middle, so there's a midline shift, but also there is some hypo density and there's hyper density at the top of it. So this is actually an acute on chronic subdural hemorrhage. So you can see the shape of it. It is a sort of concave shape, so that is more equivalent to a subdural hemorrhage. And if it was just an acute subdural hemorrhage, that whole bit would be white rather than that white on black as we can see here. In the top right, as we saw earlier, this is a hemorrhagic stroke and usually these hemorrhagic strokes tend to be more 
in towards the midline rather than on the peripheries as it tends to be related to bursting of a small artery such as a perforating artery and uh, therefore they are more likely to be in the middle and finally you have this epidural hemorrhage in the bottom right and that tends to be related to trauma and because it's in the epidural space it looks much more convex as it is bound by the dura and that can be related to classically if someone has a baseball bat to the head for example or has a acute road traffic accident for example and uh, that can be quite severe and in a lot of these uh, bleeds or actually vast majority of them, you will be expected to discuss it with the new surgical team and consider whether or not the patient has any surgical intervention that is required. So again, these are the bleeds that we talked about. So please make sure to read up on them and make sure when you are discussing with the neurosurgical team to always make a note of their GCS. That is an important indicator of whether or not surgical intervention is required. So going through the acute management of stroke, uh, the most important thing about stroke is to make sure that you act quickly and also make sure that the patient is stable. So the first thing that you should do is the ABCDE assessment, as you would normally, and you would go on to try and do a CT head as soon as possible. And if the CT head is normal, which is what we see here on this right-hand side, you would treat it as an ischemic stroke. So the idea here is that a CT head is not a diagnostic scan for a stroke. It just helps you to rule out any evidence of a bleed. So if it is within 4.5 hours and there are no contraindications, then you would consider thrombolysis with alteplase. However, if there is a CT head that shows a bleed, you would want to discuss with the neurosurgical team and also consider blood pressure control to try and get it less than 140 over 90 blood pressure wise. However, if the CT head is normal, and it's not within the 4.5 hour window, you would give 300 milligrams of aspirin for two weeks, and then you would consider giving 75 milligrams of clopidogrel thereafter. However, if they have another um, reason to have a stroke such as atrial fibrillation, you may not give the clopidogrel and you may start them on anticoagulation in the form of a direct oral anticoagulant such as rivaroxaban or apixaban. All of these patients will need physiotherapy and occupational therapy and further investigations as to why they have had a stroke. And finally, if they have a large vessel thrombus on the CT, you may consider thrombectomy. And that would usually be done by a neurovascular specialist. And just down here, you can see these thrombolysis contraindications. And in clinical practice, the contraindications tend to be people who have head trauma, for example, if they have a recent hemorrhage, recent surgery, and also if they have a very high blood pressure. So if someone has a very high blood pressure of more than 200 systolic, it's not safe to thrombolyze. So you would try and get that blood pressure down in order to um, ensure that thrombolysis is safe to give. And also if someone is on anticoagulants to start off with, or they have a high INR secondary to warfarin, then you cannot thrombolyze as the risk of bleeding is too great. As for cro chronic stroke management, uh, there is a mnemonic called HALTS, which allows you to remember what sort of management you should do going forward. So treat hypertension if it's present, antiplatelets and anticoagulation. So as we said, if there is any atrial fibrillation, you would treat with anticoagulation, otherwise with clopidogrel. You would treat with lipid lowering therapy, such as a statin. You would advise smoking cessation, screen and manage for diabetes, and if you have a patient who has carotid artery stenosis of a significant degree, they should be referred for a carotid endarterectomy. So there have been lots of trials that have showed that if you have a stroke or a transient ischemic attack secondary to carotid artery stenosis, then having an intervention such as an endarterectomy will significantly reduce your risk of stroke or transient ischemic attack going forward. So let's look at the next question, if you'd like to pause the screen and have a read. So the answer here is vital capacity. So this is a 23-year-old who has acute onset weakness in her legs shortly after returning from holiday in Spain. So there is a worsening weakness in the legs, but also weakness in both arms. So the question here is trying to ask you to figure out what is the most likely um, 
likely cause of her weakness. And the key here really is that she has it over a few days rather than over a few minutes or a few hours or something like that. So that helps you to narrow down the diagnosis into something that's probably not vascular like a stroke. And also the fact that she's young, a 23-year-old, also makes it less likely. So the thing we're thinking here is that she came back from a holiday in Spain, so she may have been exposed to something that she normally wouldn't have been. For example, she may have eaten somewhere uh, that uh, she normally wouldn't have, and she may have eaten something caused a gastroenteritis, and therefore, could this be Guillain-Barre syndrome? So that's the sort of working diagnosis we would consider in this scenario. And then the question is really asking you, what's the most important initial investigation? So with Guillain-Barre syndrome, it is an acute uh, polyneuropathy that can lead to weakness in the arms and the legs, and also it can lead to respiratory failure. And it can happen very quickly. So you need to make sure to be on top of it and refer to the intensive care unit as soon as possible. So you need to make sure that you find a way that you can monitor this patient so that if they do deteriorate, you can escalate quickly. So reviewing the answers here, full blood count might be important, but it's not the most important initial investigation as it's not terribly relevant to someone who has Guillain-Barre syndrome. Peak flow is, tends to be used for asthma and doesn't really give us that much information about the lung capacity and how well they are doing in terms of their oxygenation. And equally, serum potassium, again, would be useful um, as a general medical thing to do, but not the most important initial investigation in this scenario. And finally, the difference between an ABG and or arterial blood gas and vital capacity is something that causes a lot of confusion amongst medical students. And the reason for that is because we do arterial blood gases in a lot of patients. But the question is, why is vital capacity more important than arterial blood gas? And the reason for that is because an arterial blood gas will show evidence of hypoxia, which is useful if patients are very, very unwell. But what happens is that in patients with the Guillain-Barre syndrome, they tend to have significant reductions in vital capacity much earlier than arterial blood gas changes. So therefore, it is a much more sensitive way of understanding if a patient is deteriorating, whereas arterial blood gases, it may be too late to escalate if um, they are getting hypoxic. So therefore, the most important initial investigation is to check the vital capacity, and you can have bedside vital capacity monitors to ensure that your patient is monitored correctly. So with Guillain-Barre syndrome, as we said, it's a sending polyneuropathy. And basically, you have antibodies that are directed towards the myelin sheath. And therefore, you get slower times where the nerve impulses are generated and therefore you can get motor dysfunction and also sensory dysfunction and it's associated with lower respiratory tract infections and also gastrointestinal infections so mycoplasma campylobacter are very important and that's why we were talking about the people who have recently traveled somewhere else for example so the risk of respiratory failure is very very important so bedside spirometry so fvc is essential and the treatment would be plasma exchange and IVIG, so immunoglobulins, to try and dilute the effect of antibodies against these nerves. And always, always in this group of patients, you need to consider whether or not you should be escalating to the intensive care unit as they can deteriorate very, very quickly. So let's look at the next question. If you'd like to pause the screen and have a read. The answer here is isoniza toxicity. So we have a 54-year-old Russian man. He has altered sensation in his feet, and he has a lot of things going on. Hypertension, gout, and pulmonary TB treated in Russia. So this is a question that is asking you about the causes of altered sensation in the feet. So when we have someone who has altered sensation in the feet, we need to consider of whether or not this is a peripheral neuropathy, so a lower motor neuron lesion that could be motor or sensory. We can't see much motor here. We can mainly see sensory. And in this group of patients, we would try and screen for simpler things such as diabetes, for example. But in this particular scenario, there is no uh, past medical history of diabetes. So diabetic neuropathy is less likely. Vincristine toxicity is a chemotherapy drug, and that is often a cause of peripheral neuropathy. In this scenario, there is no evidence of any cancer in the past, so it's less likely. Equally with motor neuron disease, 
in the name, you can see that motor neuron uh, is less likely to cause sensory dysfunction, so that's less likely. And finally, with Guillain-Barre syndrome, uh, it is less likely to be so slow that it goes on for several months. And also, you may consider a motor component as well, rather than uh, just sensory on its own. So that makes it less likely. And the unifying diagnosis here is that you have someone who has pulmonary tuberculosis, who's often treated with isoniazid, and that is a recognized cause of peripheral neuropathy. So if we were to talk a bit more about peripheral neuropathy, it tends to be either sensory, sensory motor, or motor but certainly the most common that we see in clinical practice is sensory. Just to make it clear that although we talked about more rare things like isoniazid and also vincristian and chemotherapy, the most important um, causes of peripheral neuropathy are summarized in this mnemonic below on this left-hand side, A, B, C, D, E. So alcohol, B12 and folate, CKD, chronic kidney disease, diabetes, and everything else. That is the more niche aspects of peripheral neuropathy, so charcot tooth vasculitis, and lead toxicity. But I would never start off with this if someone was to ask you. So always start off with the most common stuff. So in clinical practice, it tends to be alcohol and diabetes that we see uh, in most patients. So when you're investigating, it's good to check things like B12 and folate, do a full blood count. Perhaps they have a macrocytic anemia secondary to alcohol use and also check their renal function for chronic kidney disease, and also perhaps an HbA1c. And that tends to cover most things, and you may also do a vasculitis screen as well. And if you're looking for charcot tooth, you may do genetic testing, but that tends to be beyond the remit of most medical school neurology curricula. And in terms of further investigations, you would do nerve conduction studies as it helps you to accurately tell you which part of the nerve is affected and whether or not it corresponds to the clinical picture, the subjective aspect of what the patient is telling you. And finally, if we were to just talk about Romberg's test, Romberg's test tends to cause a lot of confusion in medical students as it is often incorrectly thought to be related to cerebellar dysfunction. In fact, Romberg's test is used to test for sensory loss or sensory ataxia. So the idea with Romberg's test is you ask the patient to stand up and keep their eyes open and see if they're unstable. And then you ask them to close their eyes and then to check if they are unstable as well. And if a patient is only unstable with their eyes closed, that is a positive sign. And therefore, that is likely to be related to sensory loss because the lack of sensory input causes the patient to become unstable and becomes a bit wobbly. Whereas if you have cerebellar dysfunction, for example, you would expect them to be unstable if their eyes are both open and closed. So therefore, with Romberg's test, a positive Romberg's test is when you are when you have a patient who is unstable with their eyes closed only, and that is secondary to sensory loss or sensory ataxia or a peripheral neuropathy. Let's look at the next question. If you'd like to pause the screen and have a read. So this 45 year old gentleman has double vision and his right eye is abducted downwards and his pupil is larger than the other eye. So there seems to be a tumor that is pressing on a structure. So we're really trying to find out what possible structure is affected here. And this is related to your understanding of neuroanatomy to a certain extent, but also how to localize lesions. So you may remember that if someone who has a right eye abduction that goes downwards, that tends to be related to this syndrome that we, we would refer to as a down and out pupil, which tends to be related to a third nerve palsy. So that is the oculomotor nerve, and that's why this is correct. But if we were to look into a bit more detail, the other aspect that's important is that the pupil is larger than in the other eye. So the pupil is affected. So this comes to this um, other uh, important concept, which is whether or not you have a surgical third nerve palsy or a medical third nerve palsy. And this is related to which aspect of the third nerve that is affected. So if we were to look at the uh, this top diagram 
there is something that is affecting or pushing against the third nerve from the top. So for example, if there's a tumor which is pressing on it, it tends to affect the parasympathetic neurons, which tend to overlie the motor neurons of the third nerve. And we call these surgical causes because it tends to be something that happens to be dealt with by the surgical team. So things like tumors, things like aneurysms. So when they affect the parasympathetic neurons, they cause a dilated pupil. In contrast, a medical third nerve palsy tends to not affect the parasympathetic neurons because it's not so no, nothing is really pushing on them, but it's more affecting the intrinsic motor neurons of the third nerve. And therefore, medical causes like diabetes and vascular disease that affect the motor fibers tend to not affect the pupil. So therefore, if you have a, someone who has a third nerve palsy, it's very important that you check the pupils, as it will help you to localize whether or not it's a surgical cause or it's a medical cause, and it will help you to direct your treatment going forward. So if we were to talk a bit more about this concept of ophthalmoplegia, we talked about the third nerve palsy and uh, important to rule out the important surgical causes that may need urgent treatment and the medical causes will require some more investigations on the most part. There is a phenomenon called internuclear ophthalmoplegia, and that is when the medial longitudinal fasciculus is affected, and that is represented by the diagram below. So you can see here that when the patient is looking towards the left, they get nystagmus in the left eye, and they get an inability of adduction or adduction on that right eye. And that tends to be related to the inability of the coordination of the third, fourth, and sixth nerves which is tends to be done by the medial longitudinal fasciculus. And here that tends to be caused by multiple sclerosis. That is the usual cause, especially in exams, but can be caused by a number of things that are affecting that region. So stroke and tumor as well. Otherwise, you have sixth nerve palsy. So the sixth nerve is related to abduction of the eye, and it can be related to something that's locally affecting the brainstem. But because the sixth nerve in itself has a very long intracranial course, it can also be caused by raised intracranial pressure. So if you have someone who is acutely one, unwell, who comes in with a bleed, for example, or an intracranial hemorrhage, and they have a sixth nerve palsy, it is possible that they have raised intracranial pressure, and this is the only obvious um, examination finding, and that will lead you to treat very urgently and refer to the neurosurgical team to consider whether or not they need any intervention. And finally, when you have a fourth nerve palsy, which tends to be a difficulty in looking down or adducting, that is less common, but can be associated with trauma, for example, and also multiple sclerosis, but essentially can be caused by anything that affects the brainstem, for example, or the fourth nerve in itself. Let's look at the next question. So if you'd like to pause the screen and have a read. So the answer here is an acute stroke. So you have um, a sudden onset, unilateral face droop and weakness six hours ago, and it was not associated with any other symptoms. And on examination, there is forehead sparing on the side of the facial weakness. So this question is asking you to differentiate between the different causes of facial nerve palsy. So the most important thing is whether or not it is a lower motor neuron facial nerve palsy or if it's an upper motor neuron facial nerve palsy. And the key aspect of this question is the forehead sparing. So if you have evidence of forehead sparing, it is much more likely to be an upper motor neuron lesion. And of the answers here, Let's look at them. We need to just distinguish which is an upper motor neuron and which is a lower motor neuron. So Bell's palsy, that is lower motor neuron of the facial nerve affecting it as it's coming out. Cholesteatoma also is an affection around the ear. It is local, it is lower motor neuron. Space occupying lesion, that can like is likely to be an upper motor neuron lesion in the brain. However, it would not cause a sudden onset six hours ago um, it would not cause that sort of quick facial droop like that. And conversion disorder tends to relate to a patient who has no obvious physical um, dysfunction on examination. And again, it's less likely, as it's less likely to cause a facial droop and tends to cause motor weakness, for example. 
So that leads us to acute stroke as the only possible answer of an upper motor neuron lesion, and that is sudden. So the forehead sparing is very important because that in an upper motor neuron lesion, it's in the forehead, it is supplied by both sides of the brain. So basically, if you have a dysfunction in one side of the brain, there is also collateral supply, as it were, from the other side. Whereas if it's a lower motor neuron lesion, the forehead is not spared as the facial nerve in its entirety is affected, and therefore uh, you would expect the forehead to, to droop. And I'll, I'll show you a picture to show you what I mean. So in this particular scenario, we have a patient who, if you look at this arrow, the forehead is not spared, and therefore there is no crinkling in the forehead, and therefore the facial nerve is affected in itself, and this is a lower motor neuron lesion. And as we were saying, an upper motor neuron, it can be a lot of things, stroke, multiple sclerosis, tumor, for example. But the other aspect is a lower motor neuron lesion. And that can be related to Bell's palsy, which is thought to be an idiopathic lower motor neuron seventh nerve palsy, which tends to get better on its own after time. Ramsey-Hunt syndrome tends to be related to these vesicles that you can see in the ear. It tends to be secondary to a herpes virus. But you can also get different infections, such as Lyme disease, immune sarcoidosis. Uh, Guillain-Barre can also cause a lower motor neuron disease. Um, and local malignancy in the parotid can in be invasive and affect the facial nerve. Finally, the other aspect that tends to come up often is this um, correlation between nerve 5, 7, and 8 dysfunction that tends to be related to a cerebellar pontine angle tumor. And basically, you have a tumor which is close to the cerebellum and can be invasive and can uh, can be benign can be in, can be benign or can be malignant that tends to affect both 5 7 and 8 so if you are doing a clinical examination and you see someone who has a facial nerve palsy it's very important that you obviously do all the other cranial nerves but really hone in on whether or not the fifth and the eighth nerve through hearing is also affected as that may be the diagnosis Let's have a look at the next question, if you'd like to pause the screen and have a read. So the answer here is levodopa. So you have a 74-year-old right-handed woman who has a resting tremor in her right hand and frequent falls. She has bradykinesia, finger tapping and heel strikes, and the breast tremor is present in her right hand. So what would be the most appropriate medication to help her with her symptoms? So this is a patient with resting tremor, bradykinesia, and falls. So the most likely diagnosis here, or syndrome, is Parkinsonism. Um, and that is a representation of the uh, a number of symptoms that have been described in the past. So this bradykinesia, this tremor, postural instability as well. And the most common cause of Parkinson's syndrome is Parkinson's disease, also called idiopathic Parkinson's disease. And there is a number of different treatment options available. And as you can see, uh, you, the levodopa is the one that is used more often. And there are just the there are some other aspects that you might consider as well. So for example, if we were to look at the choices, propanolol is not really used in uh, this particular um, scenario. So you can give it in people who have resting tremor, for example, that might help, um, but it is not used in people who have Parkinson's-related tremor. Deep brain stimulation is a very advanced treatment option for Parkinson's at later stages. Equally with apomorphine injections with are also treat, are used in the later stages of the disease. Rapinirol is a dopamine agonist, and in the past, it used to be used more often in patients who have Parkinson's disease in order to reduce the amount of levodopa that they have so that it doesn't wear off and start causing side effects. The problem with rapinirol is that it can lead to lots of um, different effects on dopamine transmission and therefore can lead to lots of behavioral disturbances. And in recent times, people would start, people are now treated with levodopa first off, particularly if they have motor features. So the recommendations now is that if you have motor features of Parkinson's, you should start with levodopa as a first line. So with Parkinsonism as a syndrome, we said that there are key features, tremors, rigidity, bradykinesia, and postural instability. 
And the key is that there are differential diagnoses within Parkinsonism as itself. So we talked about Parkinson's disease, which is an idiopathic form of Parkinsonism. And uh, we also have other causes. So vascular Parkinsonism can be related to lots of uh, vascular events in the brainstem, could be secondary to stroke, or could be this sort of stepwise um, progression of motor dysfunction over time. Drugs can cause it as well. So antipsychotic drugs are important and can cause Parkinsonism. And you have Parkinson's plus syndromes. This is a group of rare diseases that can look like Parkinson's, but have different pathophysiological um, perspective or pathophysiological cause of uh, Parkinsonism. And that can be certain disorders such as progressive supranuclear palsy, or can be multi-system atrophy. And it tends to not be too much focused on in the undergraduate curriculum, but I just keep it in mind when you have patients who have Parkinsonism, but looks a bit different. So for example, if patients who have very severe Parkinsonism with early falls, who have, for example, a symmetrical tremor, um, or symmetrical features that makes them more likely to not be idiopathic Parkinson's disease. So the key in Parkinson's disease in itself is that it tends to be asymmetrical on one side to start off with. The other aspect to differentiate between essential tremor and Parkinsonism is to get them to write. So if you have an essential tremor, you would have a patient who has very difficult, uh, so very, very difficult tremor. And what happens is that if you ask them to to draw a spiral, for example, is quite large. Whereas with Parkinson's disease or Parkinsonism, what you would have is that you'd have sort of small, quite a, not a very small scroll, as it were, and this what we would call micrographia, so very, very small handwriting. So that helps you to differentiate between uh, its central tremor and Parkinsonism. And finally, although often people focus a lot on the, the motor aspects of Parkinson's disease, the other aspects can be equally distressing for patients and their families. So the common complications of Parkinson's disease are dementia, um, which can be progressive and can be related to aspects of Lewy body dementia as well, which can coexist as a spectrum, and also depression. And that can be related to organically within Parkinsonism, or it can be related to um, the fact that they are very upset by their own condition. So it's, it's difficult to tell, of course, but you may also want to screen for that during your clinics and uh, to investigate and treat appropriately. So talking about the management of Parkinson's disease, we talked about levodopa, and the first line, according to the NICE guidelines, is to offer levodopa in patients who have motor symptoms that impact their quality of life. And with levodopa, the problem with levodopa is that over time it becomes less effective, and you can get this on and off phenomenon when people can... Um, become very rigid and uh, they can freeze and it can lead to lots of gait instability and falls. So that's one thing to look out for if you're reviewing patients going forward. And again, dopamine agonists can lead to some changes um, in the uh, other aspects of the dopamine pathway. So it can lead to uh, unfortunately, things like gambling addictions, for example, and it can lead to behavioral changes that can be quite distressing. So you need to make sure to look up what's going on with your patient if you were to start them on dopamine agonists. And then the other aspects of Parkinson's disease are certainly much more specialist and focus around trying to increase dopamine release um, in the form or dopamine presence in the brain. Um, and also, as a last line, deep brain stimulation can be used. And it is not really related to dopamine release. Uh, it, is, it works by an unknown cause and requires neurosurgery and long-term follow-up by the neurosurgeons and the neurologists to see how people are doing. So let's look at the next question. If you'd like to pause the screen and have a read. So this is a 34-year-old woman who has progressive weakness in her lower limbs, and she is unable to stand, and she has spastic paraparesis, brisk knee and ankle jerks, and upgoing planters. So you can see here that she has a upper motor neuron syndrome, and also she had a similar disturbance 
Oh, but this time it was sensory in her right leg and it stayed for a few days. She thought it was sciatica. Um, but actually, when we did an MRI, she had evidence of enhancing white matter plaques in the brain and spine. So what is the next best step in the management of this patient? So really what you should be thinking of in someone who is a young woman who has a new uh, upper motor neuron lesion, you should be thinking about multiple sclerosis. So in this particular scenario, it's much more likely that she has had a relapse of her multiple sclerosis, and therefore you might treat acutely with a course of steroids, which in this case is C, intravenous steroids, methylprednisolone. And just looking at this diagram here, you, you will note that there are different types of multiple sclerosis where you have differing aspects of increasing disability. With relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis, you have um, disability that uh, has, you have a relapse and you get better and you um, improve after a few days. If you have secondary progressive multiple sclerosis, you have increasing attacks with increasing disability. And with primary progressive, you have a steady increase in disability without attacks. And um, primary progressive multiple sclerosis tends to be quite severe and um, it can lead to significant disability in a short period of time. So in this particular scenario, as far as we can tell, she had probably maybe has relapsing or remitting at this point, but regardless, we would treat her with steroids with methylprednisolone to start off with. So talking a bit more about multiple sclerosis, it is a, um, a very important disease that is quite common and predominantly affects young people and predominantly in the female population. And it, if you have relapsing remitting disease, it can continue on to become secondary progressive. Um, the important aspect of the examination is that it is an, you only have upper motor neuron lesions. So if you have anyone with a lower motor neuron lesion, it's not multiple sclerosis. So that's a good way of screening your question once you are reading it in order to differentiate between these two concepts that will help you to point you towards a diagnosis. And it can affect anywhere in the central nervous system, so in the brain and the spine. So it can lead to many different presentations. So sensory loss is one of them, so with the patchy paresthesia. Optic neuritis, so loss of the central vision with painful eye movements. That is a very common presentation. We talked about internuclear ophthalmoplegia, but you can also get cerebellar signs and you can get this spastic paraparesis where you have a effect of the multiple sclerosis on the cord in itself and it can lead to uh, bilateral upper motor neuron signs. In order to make the diagnosis, you will need to do an MRI of the brain and spine and you will need to establish whether or not there is evidence of different lesions or different attacks separated by time and space and that is what we would refer to as the McDonald's criteria and you would also do a lumbar puncture and you could check for paired oligoclonal bands in the CSF, or the cerebrospinal fluid, compared to the blood. It's not necessary for the diagnosis, but it helps to support the diagnosis of multiple sclerosis. In terms of management, as we said, if someone has an acute relapse, you would treat with steroids, which would reduce the duration and severity of the attack. But also in the acute medical setting, you would want to rule out an up a urinary tract infection or any other medical problems that may coincide. And you would um, refer to the neurologist if you have someone with a new uh, diagnosis of multiple sclerosis. And there are disease modifying agents which there are many, here's just a few, beta interferon, fingolimod, natalizumab, which tend to be beyond the remit of undergraduate curriculums. However, the um, only aspect I would mention is that these are all immunosuppressants, and therefore they can lead to an increased risk of infection. And one important one is progressive multifocal leukoencophilopathy, which is secondary to a virus called the JC virus. And this is a well-established, um, recognized complication of immunosuppressant therapy, and it can lead to significant long-term disability without any treatment that tends to be progressive. So it is something to ensure to, to do lots of um, reviews on your patient to make sure that they are improving or if they're deteriorating, and to do regular imaging to see whether or not this complication is present. Um, in the, on the most part, um, a lot of the symptomatic therapies of multiple sclerosis 
ensuring that physiotherapists are involved, occupational therapists, Botox can help with spasticity, SSRIs, and so for depression, and baclofen as well can help with spasticity. And it tends to be a multidisciplinary team approach. So that's important to mention when you are discussing multiple sclerosis and indeed in any neurological condition. Let's have a look at the next question. If you'd like to pause the screen and have a read. So we have a 30 year old who has been seizing for more than five minutes. He has a tonic clonic history, a, a history of tonic clonic seizures. And he takes Valparate. He has a history of alcohol excess. He's been very well in the few days prior to his admission. What is the most likely cause of his seizure? So this is a question to show you about the effect of um, different um, anti, uh, anti-epileptic drugs and how these can be used and how these can be affected by different things. So if we just look at the choices here, so acute stroke is less likely um, because uh, he's a 30-year-old man. We don't know much about his risk factors, but we think that is less likely. Equally with a subdural hemorrhage, again, it's less likely um, to have caused a seizure. Certainly, if you have a seizure and you bump your head, you could get a subdural hemorrhage afterwards. But again, it's less likely to have just a subdural hemorrhage on its own without any history of trauma, and he was well before. Uh, multiple sclerosis is un, a very uncommon cause of a seizure. I wouldn't expect it to cause that, so less likely. And equally, with a meningitis, not again, less likely because he, we don't have any history of him being febrile or being unwell or having a cold or anything like that in the preceding days and no rashes or anything like that. So less likely to be meningitis. So really, this question is pointing to the idea that you have someone who has epilepsy, who has seizures in the past and is on Valparate, but takes uh, drinks a lot. And as you may know, you have a number of enzyme inducers. So chronic alcohol use can induce the um, P450 enzymes and therefore lead to reduced activity of certain medications. So in this particular scenario, that's what's most probably has happened. So uh, the less activity of his anti-epileptic drugs, secondary to alcohol, has caused a seizure and he has epilepsy and that's the most likely cause of his seizure compared to the other uh, differentials here. So if we were to talk a bit more about the types of seizure, you can have focal seizures, so complex or simple, and they tend to be related to whether or not patients lose consciousness or don't lose consciousness. And these can be secondary generalized, so it become generalized after the initial stage. And when we're talking about generalized seizures, they can be absence seizures, where patient have these, patients have these vacant episodes. Tonic-clonic, which is what we would consider to be the classic seizures that we see, where patients have increased tone and they shake. Myoclonic uh, seizures are when you have these jerky movements, uh, where you have possibly a one muscle group is just jerking on its own. And finally, atonic, when you completely lose uh, your tone. Um, again, this is less common, less commonly seen. Uh, especially in the general medical environment. And in patients who have seizures or patients who have epilepsy, it's always very important to ask them about their quality of life and also how they're doing in their day-to-day. -day. So poor sleep, alcohol and drugs, and their withdrawal are very important triggers, and you should ask about that. But equally, other things can trigger seizures, obviously, especially if you have, for example, a stroke or intracranial hemorrhage, if you have someone who has risk factors, or if they're a bit older, you may consider that. So anyone who comes in, it's very important to, to do perhaps another CT head just to check that there's nothing uh, other as a cause of a seizure. And um, finally, it's someone who has a seizure. It's important to check their electrolytes, their blood tests, because there are certain metabolic disturbances for example, hyponatremia, that can very commonly cause seizures, especially if it's quite low. So it's important to do a general screen for anyone who comes in with seizures. Epilepsy management can be quite difficult, and often it is done by specialists in the specialist setting, uh, epilepsy consultants or neurologists. Um, but there are some rules of thumb which you should take into consideration. So you have um, generally lamotrigine, levetiracetam, and valparate are good for all seizure types. For focal seizures, you may consider carbamazepine, gabapentin, and phenytoin. Um, 
Ethosuximide is usually used for absence seizures, and carbamazepine can worsen myoclonic seizures. A lot of this is not so important, I guess, um, for in the undergraduate setting. The only aspect I would say that to, to really take into consideration is sodium valparate is known to be extremely teratogenic, and therefore you shouldn't be giving it to, shouldn't be starting someone who is a woman who is of childbearing age on valparate unless they're established on treatment. And usually it's a very difficult decision to make in any case. So it's very important that they are adequately um consented and adequately discuss the risks and benefits um, of being on Valparate. And they may be, um, depending on local guidelines or national guidelines where you're, where you're watching, may be required to uh, be on an oral contraceptive pill or to be on um, any uh, contraceptive that prevents them from getting pregnant, for example. And, the, and if you want to read a bit more about the common side effects of epilepsy drugs, you should look at bit.ly slash the quest book and search for epilepsy management. That'll give you a bit more information about the different side effects of each of these drugs. And as you might know, uh, one of the uh, important acute emergencies in terms of seizures is status epilepticus. And usually that is when you have a seizure that's lasting for more than a few minutes and it is very dangerous as it can lead to respiratory uh, disorders in the sense that it can lead to hypoxia and can lead to deterioration, can lead to death. So it is important to deal with it early. So you do your ABCD assessment if someone has a seizure, you would start them on lorazepam. So you give them a dose of lorazepam, four milligrams IV usually, if that doesn't work, you give them another further dose of lorazepam. According to NICE guidelines, you would start someone on a phenytoin infusion, um, which is used often, and it is technically what people give in the United Kingdom. Uh, but uh, just to make a note that there is a recent systematic review, um, or rather a, a sorry, a randomized control trial that showed that in the um, in patients who have benzodiazepine resistant status epilepticus, you can either give levetiracetam, phosphophenytoin, and valparate, and actually the efficiency of these three drugs is roughly equivalent. So there's no significant difference in the rate of seizure cessation or in safety. And in practice, it is much easier to give levetiracetam um, because uh, it is, it's less likely to cause the any extravation into the tissues, into the subcutaneous tissues, and it tends to be more present on wards, generally speaking, from my own clinical experience. So therefore, phenytoin infusion is the nice guidance. However, this may change going forward, and you may want to consider giving other things. But again, uh, this is not going to be something that's going to be a decision made um, when you are in the early years of training. You should have senior support um, when that decision has to be made. And finally, general anesthesia, um, it would be considered if all of these treatments aren't working and they are still seizing. And then you would want to, in any case, involve the uh, anesthetic team early on so that they can make that decision if things are not improving. So to complete this uh, tutorial, I'd just like to go through a more challenging question on localization. Uh, don't worry too much if you don't get it right. Um, it's just really to illustrate exam technique and to work through things. So it's going to be difficult. It's going to be a bit harder than the others, but just to really use it as a learning opportunity. Uh, and don't worry, it's we're, we're all learning here, okay? So have a look at this question and have a read. So the answer here is D, wasting of small hand muscles. So there is one key aspect uh, that you need to look at is that you need to think, is this an upper motor neuron lesion or is this a lower motor neuron lesion in anyone who has evidence of limb weakness? So we can see here that there is normal tone, but there's reduced power bilaterally, which doesn't really help us that much in terms of upper motor neuron versus lower motor neuron. But the ankle reflex is absent bilaterally, but the knee reflexes are present and the plantars are upgoing. So this is very weird because you essentially have both upper motor neuron lesion signs in the plantars are upgoing, but also the ankle reflex is absent. So really there are 
I think there's a key aspect here in that you would want to think what could possibly cause a mix upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron lesion. And in this scenario, the answer is most likely to be motor neuron disease, which can cause both upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron. But I think you can also answer this question in different ways as well. So if we were to look at the choices here, you have a pale optic disc. So we know that pale optic disc can be related to optic neuritis, and that can be related to multiple sclerosis. So this can't be multiple sclerosis because you have lower motor neuron lesions. Equally with the bottom internuclear ophthalmoplegia, the, that, as we said, is more likely to be related to multiple sclerosis, and also the oculomotor nerve is not affected in the motor neuron disease as well. So the other aspects, so positive Romberg sign, we said it's sensory, so it wouldn't be affected in motor neuron disease. And then C, postural hypotension, again, it's autonomic rather than motor. So I guess in this particular scenario, you have, you can work it out in the sense that you know it's motor neuron disease, but also knowing that there's both a mixed upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron signs, wasting of the small hand muscles is a lower motor neuron sign. So really it's in keeping with this mixed picture. Although it's also common in motor neuron disease, there is another way of working it out in that sense that it is a continuation of this lower motor neuron sign. So I guess to summarize this question and the learning points for you is that when you are looking at any question who ha that has limb weakness um, in the arms or the legs, try and ask yourself the question, is this upper motor neuron? Is this lower motor neuron? Or is this both? And now you know that mixed upper motor neuron, lower motor neuron is related to motor neuron disease. So that's a good plus. However, most questions will be a lot simpler and then they will help you to differentiate between these two things. So if it's upper motor neuron, it could be multiple sclerosis, for example. If it's lower motor neuron, it could be something like perhaps Guillain-Barre. It could be some peripheral neuropathy, one of the ones we talked about earlier. So that is the key when you are trying to localize neurology in this scenario. So to summarize, um, I've left this for you to have a read later. So I use this a lot when I was a medical student because it helped me as a shorthand for the differentials or top three or the top differentials for each one. So I would think about certain scenarios. So for example, if you have a spastic paraparesis where you have a bilateral upper motor neuron lesions, the most common would be multiple sclerosis, cord compression, possibly a stroke in the spinal cord, again, less likely, whereas a spastic hemipresis, upper motor neuron syndrome in, the, in one leg, for example, more likely to be a stroke or a tumor or multiple sclerosis. So have a read of all this and think about it in a bit more detail. Keep it as a reference source. Um, and just right at the bottom, what we talked about earlier, mixed upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron signs, motor neuron disease, but also you can get other disorders such as cervical spondylar spondylar arthropathy or spondylopathy, and finally subacute combined degeneration of the cord, secondary to B12 deficiency, can also cause upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron signs. Don't worry about this too much. Um, I've just left it as a reference resource. Some people might find it helpful. Some people think about it in different ways. But just when you're thinking about questions have your own internal representation of what you think it might be that will help you when you're looking at the choices going forward. So thank you for listening to this QuestMed SPA tutorial. Please, if you have any questions, uh, drop me an email at info at questmed.com or yezen at questmed.com. Um, check out our website. We have lots of free questions, free notes, uh, so uh, questmed.com. And then follow us on Instagram for daily questions. Uh, so we have daily single best answer questions. And also uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. And we will be trying to release weekly single best answer tutorials to help